Good afternoon, everybody. This is Intermediate Accounting Part 3. Let's start this class by the opening prayer. So let's bow our heads and feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. Dear God, our loving Father, we ask for your guidance this afternoon. We ask you to give us the necessary knowledge and wisdom so that everybody can cope up with the topics that will that we will discuss not only this afternoon but also in the coming days of this semester forgive us lord for the shortcomings forgive us for our uh, transgressions in the past days allow us to be with you at all times we knew your omnipresence we knew that you are present today in this classroom to guide us in our discussion this we pray in the precious name of your beloved son jesus christ amen good afternoon everybody so this is intermediate accounting part three this is the continuation of our previous subject intermediate accounting one and two this uh, subject is only three units as compared to the previous one which is six units so let's start the discussion So the coverage of this lecture is our course outline for the whole semester. And then we will discuss in detail the general features of the financial statements. When we say financial statements, we are referring to the statement of financial position, formerly known as the balance sheet, statement of financial performance, that is the income statement, a statement of changes in owner's equity and the cash flow statement and that includes notes to financial statements so this is the course outline of the intermediate accounting this course outline was recommended to me by the cpa review director of professional review training center or prtc he recommended the, the the flow of topics which will be suited to the needs of each student so the first one the first topic that will be discussed under this course outline of intermediate accounting part three is the general features of your financial statements and then we will cover in detail the statement of financial position or the balance sheet. And then the third one, the statement of financial position or the income statement. And then the statement of changes in owner's equity, the statement of cash flow. We will concentrate here because I knew that most of you are having confusion on how to prepare the cash flow statements we will cover many problems concerning cash flow statements so that you will be exposed to those complicated scenarios with regards to the cash flow and then we will also discuss under this subject the accounting policies changes in accounting estimates and errors so these errors that we will discuss here is connected with our auditing problems. 
and then we will tackle earnings per share. This is needed for the information of every shareholder or stockholder. Because if you are a stockholder, you want to know how much income did I earn for every share that I own. And that is the significance of earning per share. And then we will discuss operating segments. This discussion of operating segments is applicable to big companies only because the operations of these companies are quite complicated. They have different phases or segments. And then as far as I can remember, we have discussed related party disclosures in our conceptual framework and accounting standards. Related party disclosures is applicable to big companies, specifically those conglomerate companies with mother company and different subsidiaries. Next, next. we will also discuss financial reporting in hyperinflationary economies. What do you mean by hyperinflationary? There is an inflation which is different from an ordinary inflation. Our country actually experienced hyperinflationary economies in 1983 when there were some uh, political issues in our country and also in 2000, in year 2001, I think, because of some political unrest. And then we will have the interim financial reporting. What do you mean by the word interim? Interim means temporary, meaning the financial statements that the company will issue is temporary in nature. It, it refers to an audited financial statements. And also we will discuss the cost basis of accounting, accrual basis, we will compare cost basis from accrual and likewise the single entry method. We will also discuss accounting for medium-sized entities and the last one, the small and micro entities. So all these topics will be covered during the whole semester. Let's pray that we will finish all these topics. And I think there is no reason why we cannot finish these topics because under the online classes, nobody can prevent us in conducting classes. Even there is, even if it is a holiday, even if there is a typhoon, we can proceed with our class because we are doing this at home. So there is no reason, I think, for us not to cover everything this semester. And these are the information to be presented in the financial statement of financial position. Let's now discuss the first financial statement. The first financial statement is called statement of financial position, formerly known as balance sheet. So, as a minimum, the statement of financial position shall include line items that present the following amounts. So, what do you mean by the word minimum? Meaning, these are the account title that should appear. When you say minimum, you can add more account title but you are not supposed to reduce the account title enumerated here. That is why it is called minimum. Again, I will repeat, you can add more account title, but you cannot reduce or eliminate even one account title in this particular statement of financial position. What do you mean by line item? Meaning, Property, plant, and equipment is one item. Investment property is one item. If you say line item, every account title is given 
one line, a specific line in the statement of financial position. So let's discuss then one by one, property, plant, and equipment. Everybody knows what do we mean by this. This was already discussed in your uh, fundamentals of accounting. This refers to machines, equipment, building, land, transportation vehicles, furniture and fixtures, and other fixed assets. And then investment property, we are referring to our investments in a specific property that earns income. Example, we owned a commercial building. That commercial building is being rented to other parties, to other people, to other companies. So we earned income out of that building because we acquired that building not to be used for our business, but rather to offer us office space for other party, for other businesses, we allow other people or companies to occupy our property in exchange for a rent. In other words, when you say investment property, we are earning profit out of that property that we acquired. Intangible asset, Examples of intangible assets are patents, copyright, uh, franchise, licenses. If we spend a certain amount of money to acquire intangible assets, to acquire those intangible assets that I mentioned that will appear in your balance sheet, as one of the assets. Example, our company decided to acquire franchise from Jollibee. That means Jollibee will allow our company to use the trade name, the outlet name of Jollibee. They also allow us to use the products of Jollibee to be distributed to the customers. So when we acquire franchise from Jollibee, we will pay Jollibee. And the amount that we pay to Jollibee is an intangible asset on our part. We invested a certain amount of money to the franchise of Jollibee. And the peso amount that we use to acquire the franchise of Jollibee is considered intangible asset. And then we have financial assets excluding amounts shown under E, H, and I. So when we say letter E, that is investment accounted for using the equity method. We will discuss later what do we mean by equity method. And these financial assets also excluded cash and receivables. So what are financial assets therefore? This refers to our investments in other companies. For your information, these financial assets are already discussed in our intermediate accounting one. When we say financial assets, it is either we invested to the shares of stocks of another company. We may have invested in the corporate bonds of other corporations. Me, we may have invested in the government bonds issued by the Republic of the Philippines. So those are financial assets which would be shown in our uh, statement of financial position. It occupies one line item in the balance sheet or statement of financial position. 
And then letter E, investments accounted for using the equity method. We will discuss this later on. I want all of you to be enlightened about investments accounted using the equity method. And then we have biological assets. We already discussed this topic in our conceptual framework and accounting standards. I hope everybody is still remember this topic. When you say biological assets, we are referring to the plants, to the animals, and actually biological assets is applicable to agricultural businesses. And then we have inventories. Everybody know what we meant. Uh, everybody knows what we meant by inventories. We have different types of inventories. In a merchandising concern, we have the merchandise inventory. In the, a manufacturing concern, we have raw materials, we have work in process, and we have finished goods inventories. So these inventories, whether you are a manufacturing or a merchandising business, all of this should appear in our statement of financial position that occupies one line item. Next, trade and other receivables, we are referring to accounts receivable. If your business is a merchandising business, you sold merchandise on account, these are considered trade and other receivables. And then cash and cash equivalents. We also discussed this in our auditing problem. We are conducting substantive audit of cash and cash equivalents. And everybody knows the meaning of cash equivalents or cash, uh, other cash items. And then letter J, total assets classified as held for sale and assets included in disposal groups classified as held for sale in accordance with PFRS number five. I will advise everybody to read the contents of PFRS number five for you to understand assets classified as held for sale and then trade and other payables if your business is manufacturing or merchandising you purchase raw materials on account the unpaid amount is classified as payable and the same is true with merchandising business so we have provisions we are referring to the allowance for doubtful accounts accumulated depreciations, those are considered provisions and deducted from the cost of the asset. And then financial liabilities. So when we say financial liabilities, this, this refers to our obligations in connection with the issuance of investment instruments. Take note, excluding amounts shown under K and letter L. So, for example, you issue bonds to the customers, uh, to the investors. Whenever you issue bonds, you will receive money. What is the entry upon issuance of bonds, debit, cash, credit, bonds payable? The bonds payable that we have recorded is classified as financial liability. And then liabilities and assets for current tax as defined in PAS, Philippine Accounting Standards number 12, that covers income taxes. So we will discuss later on in detail what are deferred assets and what are deferred uh, tax liabilities. And that is letter O, deferred tax liabilities and deferred tax assets 
as defined in Philippine Accounting Standards Number 12. If I were you, I will read Philippine Accounting Standards Number 12 in detail. And then liabilities included in disposal groups classified as held for sale in accordance with PFRS Number 5. We will also discuss this in detail. And then, non-controlling interest presented within the equity. If you are enrolled today, this semester in business combination, you will discuss also non-controlling interest. What do you mean by non-controlling interest? Our company invested in the shares of stocks with another company. Our investment in that particular company is very minimal. Example, it is only 10%. That investment of 10% will be considered non-controlling interest because we are only minority shareholders. Remember, if you are just a minority shareholder, you cannot control the whole company. That is why your interest in that particular corporation is considered non-controlling. And then issued capital and reserves attributable to owners of the parent. Again, this item if you are enrolled in business combinations this semester, this will also be discussed. Issued capital, meaning you acquire certain ownership in a certain company. Instead of paying cash, you issue shares of stocks and reserves attributable to owners of the parent. So let's discuss the teacher's notes and perception regarding this matter. So financial assets in this context generally refers to short and long-term investments. It is either investment in stocks or investment in bonds. Financial assets may be uh, short-term or long-term. If you will still remember our discussion in Intermediate Accounting Part 1, we have financial assets measured at fair value through profit or loss and financial assets measured at fair value through other comprehensive income. So we will discuss all those things again as a review for you to comprehend and appreciate the significance of financial assets in, present, in the presentation of a statement of financial position. Investments using equity method. Now, I will explain to you the meaning by example of investments using equity method. Remember this because this will also be tackled in your business combination subject. Let's discuss. This is an example. We can only understand the meaning of investment using equity method by citing example. And this is the example. When a corporation invested in the shares of stocks of B Corporation and the ownership of A is 25%, that means A has significant influence in B. What do you mean by the word or the term significant influence? Remember, we have two corporations here, A Corporation and B Corporation. A Corporation purchase shares of stocks. 
of B. The ownership of A to the shares of stocks of B is 25%. If that is the case, A has significant influence. When can you say that a corporation has significant influence over another corporation? Let's put it this way. There is a ruling. The ruling is if the investment of one company is 20% or more to another company, that company is considered has significant influence. Remember this ruling. This will also be applied in your business combination subject. Again, I will repeat, Mr. A invested in the shares of stocks of B. The investment of A is 25%. If that is the case, A, Corporation A, has significant influence to Corporation B because the investment of A Corporation is more than 20%. Because the ruling is that if you have at least 20% investment, your company can be considered has significant influence. Remember that. So in this case, we are talking about investment using equity method. So A invested to B and the investment of A is 25% and A has significant influence. So read letter B. If company A has significant influence over company B, the equity method of valuing investment should be followed, should be applied. I will repeat. Remember this statement letter B. If company A has significant influence over company B, the equity method of valuing investment should be followed, should be applied. In other words, the equity method of investment is applicable only on the part of A if A has significant influence over B. And what is significant influence? If your investment is at least 20% or more, you are considered has significant influence. Remember that, gentlemen and ladies. Also, remember letter C. Under the equity method of investment, the share in net income was added to the cost of investment while share in dividends was deducted. Example, company A invested 2 million to company B. And then company B, the investee earned profit. Of course, company A will have a share in the profit of company B. The share of company A to the profit of company B will be added to the cost of investment of company A. In case company B declared dividend, the share of dividend of company A should be deducted from the cost of investment of company A. Remember this ruling, gentlemen and ladies. This is very significant in intermediate accounting and also in advanced accounting or business combination. And what is the logic behind why we are doing this in equity method? The logic behind in this computation is the procedure in retained earnings wherein net income is added while dividend declaration is deducted. Try to review our accounting for corporations. In accounting for corporations, we have retained earnings. What is retained earnings? 
This is the accumulated earnings of the corporations of the previous years accumulated and retained in this particular account which is part of the capital. If there is net income, the net income will be added to retained earnings. If you declare dividends, the dividends will be de deducted from retained earnings. And that logic, that procedure in retained earnings is applied in the equity method of investment. Try to understand this. The principle in retained earnings was applied in the equity method of investment wherein share in net income is added and share in dividend declared is deducted. We have a question here. Supposing an investor has less than 20% ownership in the shares in the company, would that mean that he has no significant influence? My company is a company. I invested in the shares of stocks of B company. But my ownership is only 15%. Would that mean that I have no significant influence? Generally, the answer is yes. Because my investment is less than 20%. I have no significant influence following that ruling. But in every rule, there are some exceptions. So let's discuss. As a general rule, if an investor holds less than 20% in the shares of a company, he cannot exercise influence. That is clear. That is the rule. And that is the general rule. However, there are some instances that an investor has less than 20% investment and can still exercise significant influence because of business connections and political inclinations. That is the exception to the rule. Remember that, ladies and gentlemen, the general rule, if your investment is less than 20%, you have no significant influence. You cannot influence anybody. But the exception to the rule if that is that if you have business connections, if you have so much political inclinations, you can have significant influence in your company even if your investment is less than 20%. So let's discuss this illustrative problem concerning equity method. As I have said, you cannot understand the concept and the theory without illustrative problem. So let's read this illustrative problem. Amanda Company purchased 25% of the shares of stocks of Syra Company for 2 million pesos on January 2. 2021. So we have two parties, Amanda Company and Syrah Company. Amanda purchased 25% of Syrah and that happened at the beginning of 2021. At the end of 2021, Syrah Company reports a net income of 500,000 and pays 100,000 in dividends to all its shareholders. The problem is clear. Amanda is a shareholder of Syra, but the share of Amanda is 25%. My question is, is Amanda has significant influence? The answer is yes, because the investment of Amanda is more than 20%. What method will Amanda be, will be using? Amanda Company will use equity method. Why? Because the investment of Amanda is 20%, more than 20%. Therefore, Amanda has significant influence. Remember, if the investment of the company is more than 20%, the company, the investor, will use the equity method. So the question number one is, what is the journal entry 
on the books of Amanda Company for her, for her investment in Syrah Corporation. Remember, as I have said, in auditing, even in accounting, you must know the transactions. You must know the transactions from the beginning up to the end, including journal entries. That is why for every problem that I made, I always make sure that you know the journal entries. So that is the question number one. What is the journal entry on the books of Amanda Company for her investment in Syra Corporation? Question number two. What is the journal entry on December 31, 2021 to adjust the value of Amanda's investment? So we will prepare an adjusting entry because we will revise the cost of the investment. We are using equity method. That is why at the end of the year, December 31, 2021, we will make an adjusting entry so that we can use the equity method and adjust the value of the investment of Amanda to Syrah Corporation. So let's now present the solution for this problem. So the first question is, what is the journal entry on the books of Amanda Company for her investment in Syrah Corporation? So of course, the entry is very simple investment in Syrah Corporation or you will use the account title financial asset. Debit investment in Syrah Corporation or financial asset 2 million pesos. That is the entry on the debit side. Of course, the entry on the credit side is cash 2 million pesos. So this is the entry, the first entry upon investment of Amanda to Syrah. Remember, the percentage of ownership is 20% and Amanda has significant influence because the investment is more than 20%. So to record the 25 investment in the ownership of Syrah Corporation. Question number two, what is the journal entry on December 31, 2021 to adjust the value of Amanda's investment? We will now adjust using the equity method because the investment of Amanda is more than 20%. So let's compute the original investment at, at the, the Syrah Corporation is the investee. Amanda invested to Syrah. And then Syrah Corporation earned 500,000 net income. Therefore, we will recognize the share of Amanda to Syrah. Since the investment of Amanda is 25%, we will get the 25% of net income of Saira. Therefore, the entry is debit investment in Saira of 125,000 pesos. Why we debited? Why? Why is the entry just like that? Why we debited investment in Saira? Because we will increase the investment of Syrah because we are using the equity method. And under the equity method, we are using the principal in retained earnings wherein any income is added. That's, that's why the share of Amanda in the net income of Syrah, which is 25% of 500,000, is added. That is why the entry is debit investment in Syrah Corporation 125,000 and credit income from investment 125,000 pesos. How can you present this account title in the financial statements? Of course, investment in Syrah will be part of the total assets 
of Amanda Company, while income from investment will be part of the income statement of Amanda Company. Income from investment of 125,000 will be included in the other income of Amanda Company in the income statement or statement of financial performance. So here, our explanation is to record the 25% share in the net income of Syrah Corporation. Remember, we are using the equity method. And under the equity method, we will follow the principle in retained earnings wherein net income will be added and dividend declaration will be deducted. So let's see the next entry. The next entry is debit cash, 25,000. What is that 25,000 pesos? Syrah Corporation declared dividend amounting to 100,000 pesos. The investment of Amanda in Syrah is 25%. 25% of 100,000 is 25,000. That is why we receive our share in the dividend of Syrah. That is why our debit is cash 25,000 and credit investment in Syrah Corporation 25,000. Look at the credit side. We reduce the investment in Syrah Corporation. The question is what is the logic the 25,000 is the income from dividend that we earned from Saira? Why is our investment account reduced? Because we are using the equity method, and under the equity method, we are following the principles in retained earnings wherein net income is added and dividend declaration is deducted. That is why we reduce investment in Saira Corporation by 25,000 pesos. And our explanation is to record the dividend received from Saira Corporation and that is 25% of 100,000 pesos. I think this is very clear to everybody. Under the equity method, we are following the principle in retained earnings. That is why it is equity method. We are following what is being done in the equity, in the shareholders' equity. Next. Let's now compute for the new balance of investment in Syrah Corporation because we were able to change or adjust the value of the investment in Syrah by using equity method. So, this is the T account of investment in Syrah Corporation. The first entry is 2 million. That was at the beginning of 2021, wherein Syrah invested 2 million pesos. And then we added 125,000 pesos. That is our share in the net income of Saira. And then we will deduct the, our share in retained earnings of 25,000 pesos. Because the retained earnings of Saira is 100,000 pesos, we multiply 25%. Our share in the retained earnings of Saira is 25,000. So if we will get the total of the debit side, 2,125,000, the total in the credit side is 25,000. Therefore, the balance of investment in Saira Corporation is 2,100,000 pesos using the equity method. Why are we using the equity method? Because the investment of Amanda to Saira is more than 20%. What do you mean that 20%? Because Amanda has significant influence over Saira. I hope this is very clear to everybody. And this is the equity method concerning investment, which is a financial asset. 
And this is part of your balance sheet or statement of financial position. So let's proceed to the next topic. This is a very short lecture. The next in, uh, item that occupies one line item in the statement of financial position is the total assets classified as held for sale and assets included in disposal groups. What do you mean by held for sale? We have various assets in our possession. We have to do some reclassification. The assets being used in business operations are classified separately under property plan and equipment. But all those assets which are subject for sale will also be classified separately and treated separately. This will be included among assets under the disposal groups and that is in accordance with Philippine Financial Reporting Standards number 5, non-current assets held for sale and discontinued operations. So, we will segregate those assets which are to be sold to another parties. Remember, these assets are no longer be used in operations. That is why they are intended for resale. They are no longer functioning as intended. They are included in the disposal groups. And what do you mean by this? Discontinued operations. Because is a company is planning to discontinue their operations, some assets or almost all assets will be included in this non-current assets held for sale. That is why we included discontinued operations because this, uh, this is being done by companies who is planning to stop their respective operations. So, Philippine Financial Reporting Standards number 5, paragraph 6, provides that a non-current asset or disposal group is classified as held for sale if the carrying amount will be recovered principally through a sale rather than continuing usage. So this is the provision of the, our accounting standard. The carrying amount. When do you what do you what do you mean by carrying amount? This is the other term for the book value. The carrying amount is also the book value. So the company wants to recover the carrying amount, and that recovery or the carrying amount can be done only through disposal, through sale transaction, not on continuing usage. Because some may think that these assets can still be used in operations. If that is the case, if you will use this asset in operations, you are not supposed to include these assets as, as those held for sale. Therefore, all assets classified under this category should be intended for sale. And that is not according to me, but according to Philippine Financial Reporting Standards number 5. So let's see my own perception about this subject matter. This is mostly applicable to fully depreciated and non-performing assets. Most of the time, we cannot avoid that some of our assets becomes outdated. In our experience, as far as I can remember, in one of the commercial banks which I came from, and that was in year 2007, we are using 
computer equipment with big monitor, meaning the monitor of that computer equipment is not like the monitor that we are using today. Because today we are using a flat screen monitor. Before 2007, all our computer equipment are just like that. The monitor is not a flat screen monitor. And that old model of computer equipment occupied a large portion of the table of the employee. Whereas, if you will buy a flat screen, it is just like a laptop that will not occupy a large portion of your table. So, meaning, all those computers which are not flat screen are considered outdated. So, our company decided to dispose all those computer equipment. And this computer equipment for sale will be classified as non-current asset held for sale because they are already replaced by new computers with flat screen. And then another year passed by. In 2000, uh, I think in 2016, new models of desktop computers are introduced in the business world. Before, I think before 2015 or 2016, we are using desktop with big hard disk. If you can see some computers, I think some computers in our university today is not yet updated. We have that big hard disk, the tall hard disk uh, uh, under the table. It is placed under the table of the employee. The hard disk, the CPU itself, is very big and occupies a lot of space under the table of the employee. Here comes 2016, I think, new model, new models were introduced wherein the CPU or hard disk is already placed at the back of the monitor, monitor or flat screen. So what is the appearance of the new model of the computer? It appears that the new model has no CPU because you cannot see the CPU, it is part of the flat screen. So in that case, the, most of the banks again change their computer equipment. The old ones with big CPUs are all disposed and classified as non-current assets held for sale. That is why the accounting standard decided to create a separate account title, a separate line portion to be occupied in the balance sheet as non-current assets held for sale because of the frequent changes in model of some of our equipment in the office. And we consider all those assets as outdated. In some instances, the fully depreciated assets will be classified as non-current assets held for sale. And also those assets who are no longer performing as intended will be subject for disposal and be part of the non-current assets held for sale. So the basic function of management actually is to look for the best opportunities. And this is the best opportunity of management to dispose non-performing outdated assets outmodeled assets 
to replace by new ones and the disposal will be converted to cash. Although management may suffer losses because maybe the selling price may be lower than the carrying value, but there is nothing wrong with that as long as the management is earning a lot of profit. In our case, where I came from one of the biggest banks in the country, we, we allow selling of outdated assets even at a loss because the bank can absorb losses as long as we upgrade our equipment there is nothing wrong with that and that disposal is an opportunity of management to upgrade our computer equipment to meet the demands of the clients customers and stakeholders that's why obsolete machines, equipment, and computers were considered opportunities when classified as non-current assets held for sale. Remember, in business, there were so many opportunities. Some may look obsolete machines as a negative aspect in business. Some may say that if our equipment and computers are already outdated and obsolete, we are on the negative side. Actually, this is an opportunity. We can always convert any problem into an opportunity. So, the classification of non-current assets held for sale is an opportunity to management to dispose them in exchange for cash. And the receipt of cash may add to our liquidity position. Companies may always absorb losses suffered as a result of disposal of these assets, but that is okay as long as we can upgrade our system. And by doing so, we can absorb those losses, we can convert those losses into a profit. Instead of simply disposing to trash, this can be sold and converted to cash. So, as I have said, this is an opportunity to everybody. Instead of simply throwing them to the trash can, that can be considered an opportunity to convert everything to cash. So, that ends my lecture this afternoon i hope again i hope and always hoping that you learn something from our lecture try to understand try to watch again this recorded video so that you can absorb everything that we discuss in accounting because in accounting as long as you understand the concepts the basic theories the basic problems, you can always survive. Even if the problem will become complicated, you can still solve the problem because you know the basic principles and concepts. So that ends my lecture. Let's end this session by a prayer again. Let's bow our heads. Let's feel the presence of the Holy Spirit this afternoon. Lord God, we thank you so much for giving us enough knowledge and wisdom to discuss and understand this topic. We are hoping that all the topics that we discuss in this subject matter will be covered in the coming board exam so that everybody will get a passing mark. This we pray in the precious name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So thank you and goodbye everybody. Enjoy your day for the next subject.